Okay. All right, so I am defense attorney. I am the court. I am the witness. And I am plaintiff attorney. And so each one of these, let's do three times. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do it then. Okay, but we'll do it three times, Susie. And then Just we'll the first the next one, one, not the technical, right? We'll do that next. Okay, ready? <clears throat> At page 2, line 3. On page 7, line 14. Referring to page 10, line 15. Turn to page 17, line 25. Let me direct your attention to page 21, line 11. In your deposition on page 28, line 19. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 32, line 2. The answer appears on page 37, line 17. Please read your answer on page 44, line 20. We will amend the transcript at page 49, line 20. At page 51, line 7. On page 56, line 8. Referring to page 60, line 23. Turn to page 64, line 20. Let me direct your attention to page 73, line 5. In your deposition on page 76, line 15. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 83, line 24. The answer appears on page 90, line 16. Please read your answer on page 91, lines 23 and 24. Okay, let's do it uh, one more time, but two more times. Two more times. At page 2, line 3. On page 7, line 14. Referring to page 10, line 15. Turn to page 17, line 25. Let me direct your attention to page 21, line 11. In your deposition on page 28, line 19. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 32, line 2. The answer appears on page 37, line 17. Please read your answer on page 44, line 20. We will amend the transcript at page 49, line 23. At page 51, line 7. On page 56, line 8. Referring to page 60, line 23. Turn to page 64, line 20. Let me direct your attention to page 73, line 5. In your deposition on page 76, line 15. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 83, line 24. The answer appears on page 90, line 16. Please read your answer on page 91, lines 23 and 24. Okay, one more time. At page 2, line 3. On page 7, line 14. Referring to page 10, line 15. Turn to page 17, line 25. Let me direct your attention to page 21, line 11. In your deposition on page 28, line 19. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 32, line 2. The answer appears on page 37, line 17. Please read your answer on page 44, line 20. We will amend the transcript at page 49, line 23. At page 51, line 7. On page 56, line 8. Referring to page 60, line 23. Turn to page 64, line 20. Let me direct your attention to page 73, line 5. In your deposition on page 76, line 15. Directing your attention to the testimony on page 83, line 24. The answer appears on page 90, line 16. Please read your answer on page 91, lines 23 and 24. This is technical. And it begins with the plaintiff. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Hall, have you ever had your deposition taken before? Yes. I am sure you have had an opportunity to talk about it with Mr. Mallory, but I would like to go over a few of the ground rules so that we understand what we are doing today and the purpose of what we are doing and the mechanics. The woman to my right and your left is transcribing everything that's said. It will be put into booklet form. It will look just like this. You will have a chance after it is transcribed to review it for accuracy and content and make any changes that you feel are appropriate. I should warn you, however, that the extent that you do make changes in the document, I would be entitled to comment on those changes at the time of trial, and it may affect the veracity of your testimony. Essentially, the process is one of question and answer, 
and we should try and separate out our responses one to the other so that we aren't talking on top of each other. That will ingratiate us immensely with the reporter. Also, we should try to verbalize our responses rather than shaking the head or nodding. That's important because obviously she can't take down a nod of the head. If you don't understand a question, don't hesitate to tell me if it is unclear, and I will try and rephrase it and make it clear. I am not trying to trick you. I am trying to find out what you know today about the subject matter of this lawsuit and the documents I have in front of me. So, we want you and your replies to be your best response. I am not trying to trick you into saying something that you don't intend. If you have any questions, feel free to stop my questioning. If you want to talk with your counsel, that's fine. If you want to take a break, just tell me. We will go off the record, take a break. If you want to consult with your attorney or whatever, is there any medical reason why you can't give your best testimony today? Not that I am aware of. Okay, why don't we proceed then? Could you please give me your present residence? Yes, 3410 South Main Street. Is that in the city of Santa Ana? Santa Ana. Is there any apartment number? Yeah, B8. B8. What is your educational background, Mr. Hall? I have two degrees. What's your first degree? Bachelor of Science. And in what? Business Administration. And you said you had a second degree? That's correct. What is that? MBA. Masters of Business Administration. That's right. From which institution did you receive your first degree, your bachelor's? UCLA. And your master's degree? USC. After receiving your MBA from the University of Southern California, did you commence working for an employer? Yes, I did. And who was that? Well, maybe to make it simpler, when did you graduate with an MBA? 1964. 1964. Between the period of 1964 and, say, 1977, can you just give us a brief summary of your employment background rather than... Okay. First situation, first position was as an accountant with the Mobile Oil Company. Let me ask you a question there. When you state an accountant, were you a certified public accountant? No. Okay, you performed an accounting function, though, for Mobile Oil. That's correct. So essentially, you worked for the finance department for Mobile Oil. No, that's not correct. Okay, what department did you work for? Basically, the job dealt with accounting for the payments on leases between various entities. Okay, were you a bookkeeper? Is that what you are saying, or what? It wouldn't be called bookkeeper, but it was just basically an accounting job, clerical type job. Sure, let's move on. How long did you work there approximately? About two years. So then in 1966, you got a new job, and that was when? I was working for myself. Okay, and in what capacity were you self-employed? In security. Were you a registered broker? That's correct. When did you, was it an NASD license? Yes. When did you receive your NASD license? Sometime in 1965, I believe. Were you registered with any boards of exchange at that time? Yes, I was. Which were those boards? New York Stock Exchange. Do you still have an NASD license? No, I do not. When did you cease having an NASD license? 1975. Were you ever registered with any other boards of exchange other than the New York Stock Exchange? Yes. What were those boards? CBOE. Now, were you ever registered with that? Strike that question. Were you solely employed from 1966 to 1977 as an NASD broker without any affiliation? I don't think I understand that. Do you understand the question, Mr. Hall? No. Okay, you said that you were self-employed as a broker in 1966 after you terminated your employment with Mobile Oil. Were you affiliated with anyone when you worked as a broker at that time? Yes. So let's not stop between... I object. On what grounds? It's irrelevant. Sustained. Objection. Upon what grounds? It is immaterial. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Lack of foundation. Be denied. We object. State your grounds. Calls for a conclusion. I'll sustain the objection. Object. What grounds? The question has already been asked and answered. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Vague and ambiguous. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Calling for a conclusion. Sustained. Objection. Upon what grounds? Leading and suggestive. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Best evidence rule. Be denied. We object. State your grounds. Not within the issues. I'll sustain the objection. Object. On what ground? Improper foundation. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Argumentative. Overruled. I object. On what ground? It's irrelevant. Sustain. Objection. Upon what ground? It is immaterial. Overruled. I object. On what ground? Lack of foundation. Be denied. We object.
State your ground. Calls for a conclusion. I'll sustain the objection. Object. What ground? The question has already been asked and answered. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Vague and ambiguous. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Calling for a conclusion. Sustained. Objection. Upon what grounds? Leading and suggestive. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Best evidence rule. Be denied. We object. State your ground. Not within the issues. I'll sustain the objection. Object. What grounds? Improper foundation. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Argumentative. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? It's irrelevant. Sustained. Objection. Upon what grounds? It is immaterial. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Lack of foundation. Be denied. We object. State your ground. Calls for a conclusion. I'll sustain the objection. Object. What ground? The question has already been asked and answered. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Vague and ambiguous. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Calling for a conclusion. Sustained. Objection. Upon what grounds? Leading and suggestive. Overruled. I object. On what grounds? Best evidence rule. Be denied. We object. State your ground. Not within the issues. I'll sustain the objection. Object. What ground? Improper foundation. I'll let the witness answer. Objection. On what grounds? Argumentative. Overruled. I am defense attorney Ms. White, W-H-I-T-E. I am the court. I am the witness. And I am plaintiff attorney Ms. Hunt. This is from March 2008, CSR. Begins with me, Ms. Hunt. We're at 200 for 10 minutes. Ready? What did you do at that time? We directed the defendant to place his hands where we could see them and step away from the bench. Excuse me, Your Honor. If the witness could be directed to just testify as to what he personally did, that would make it easier. Is that an objection? Yes, Your Honor. Objection. I can clear it up, Your Honor. All right. Overruled. Next question. Officer, when you entered the garage, what did you do? I instructed the defendant to put his hands where I could see them. All right. Did he immediately comply? Yes, he did. Was there anyone else in the garage with the defendant when you first approached? Yes. There was another male subject who was seated on the west side in a recliner. Were any instructions given to that subject? Definitely. He was instructed to do the same thing, to display his hands and to get down on the ground. Did you also order the defendant to get down on the ground? No, I did not. I just instructed him to step back from the work area. Now, I want to show you some pictures here and see if you recognize these. Are you going to be marking these as exhibits at this time? Yes, Your Honor. I have three photographs that I would like to mark as next in order. They may be so marked for identification. Okay, on this photograph here at 16, do you recognize what this depicts? Yes, that is the chair where the other male subject was sitting when we entered the garage. All right, and how about 17? That would be the workbench area where the defendant was standing. And how about 18? That would be another view of the same place where the defendant was when we first entered. Now I want to ask you about what you found when you entered the garage. You testified earlier that you had been observing the defendant for some time. Yes, that's correct. How was it that you were first connected to the defendant? Objection vague. Sustained. What was it that brought you to be outside his home that morning? We had been monitoring drug activity in the neighborhood and had traced some of the sales to that address. Did you have any knowledge before that day of what kind of drugs you were expecting to find at that residence? Yes. Did you expect to find cocaine? Objection leading. Sustained. Let me go back and start it this way. You testified before that you had the information from Officer Brown that the defendant had sold him drugs. Is that right? Yes, it is. And tell the jury now who Officer Brown is. He is a police officer for the Anaheim Police Department, and he was working as an undercover officer. All right. Now, is he your partner? Partner. He is not my partner, but we do work for the same department. All right. Now, without telling us what Officer Brown relayed to you, were you of the opinion that the defendant was dealing drugs out of his home? Yes. Had you observed any drug transactions yourself between the defendant and Officer Brown? Yes, I have. All right. Tell us approximately how many you had knowledge of. Objection. Vague. Your Honor, this deals with the subject matter that we discussed before. All right.
Okay. If we could have a time frame, I think that would take care of the objection. Counsel, perhaps you could rephrase your question. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Officer, in the three months before the defendant's arrest, how many transactions did you observe between the defendant and Officer Brown? I would estimate that there were approximately 10. And those would be times where Officer Brown was buying drugs from the defendant? Yes. What drugs did he buy in his undercover role? It was mostly cocaine, but there was also marijuana and some meth. All right. Now, when you made entry to the defendant's home, tell us what you saw. The defendant and the other male were packaging cocaine. What did you see on the work table in front of the defendant as you approached him? There were several small bundles of a white substance immediately in front of him. There was also a scale and packaging material. Now, I assume that the defendant was removed from the residence at some point, is that correct? Yes. Was he arrested? Yes, both subjects were arrested eventually. Okay, did you conduct a search of the premises at that time? Yes, we did. Were you involved in that search? I was, that's correct. Tell us what else you found on that day. Do you mean just in the garage or the entire house? Let's start with the garage where the defendant was standing. If you could, start with the work table area where you observed the defendant. Was there something else that you saw on that table? Yes. In addition to the drugs, there was also a box of ammunition on the table. What kind of ammunition are we talking about? There was a box of shotgun shells to the right of the table. Right above the table was a shelf that had a loaded shotgun. Was that within reach from where the defendant was standing? Objection. Speculation. Sustained. Well, how tall was the shelf where you observed the gun? I would estimate that it was approximately eight feet off the ground. All right. Did you see that shotgun as you first approached the garage? Yes, I did. Is that one of the reasons why you asked to have the defendant's hands where you could see them? Well, that's standard whenever we are approaching suspects, but the knowledge that there were weapons in the garage is also a consideration. Did you have knowledge before that day that the defendant was known to have weapons in his possession? Yes, I did. And did that come from Officer Brown? Objection. Calls for hearsay. I will withdraw the question, Your Honor. All right. It is withdrawn. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. If I could just have a moment before I begin? Yes, that's fine. Officer, I want to ask you some questions about your surveillance of my client's home. All right. You testified before that you arrived on the scene at approximately 6 o'clock that morning. Is that right? Yes, I did. Where did you position yourself upon arrival? I was in the police van that was parked down the street from the defendant's location. Did you arrive to that location in that van? No. The van was there before I arrived. I was in an unmarked vehicle. I parked around the corner and then walked to the van. So you were familiar with where the van was parked before you arrived there? Yes. How did you know where the van was when you arrived there? Objection irrelevant. Overruled. You may answer. I was in telephone contact with the officers in the van. I already knew what the van looked like, so it wasn't hard to find. All right, describe what kind of automobile this is for the jury, please. It is just a regular van similar to what you would see on the road. Was it equipped with all the fancy equipment in the back section like we see in the movies? No, definitely not. It is simply a regular passenger van that we utilize. All right. Now, once you were inside the van, were you able to observe the front of my client's home? I could see the garage, but not the front of the residence. Was the door open when you initially arrived? Correct. All right. Now, did you see the defendant at that time? Not when I first arrived. Mr. Blake was in the garage by himself. Mr. Blake is the other man that was in the garage and was arrested with the defendant? Yes, that is correct. Okay. When did you notice my client to enter the garage that morning? He left the house and came around to the garage just before 8 o'clock. Did he remain within your vision the whole time until you arrested him? Yes, he did. All right. Did you actually enter the residence at that address? Yes, I did. Was there anyone else in the home on that morning? Yes. The defendant's wife and two of his children were there. Did you have any contact with the defendant's wife? Yes, I did. When did you first have any contact with her? We were securing the residence and asked everyone to step into the living room. All right. Where was the defendant's wife when you first spoke to her? She was in the kitchen at the table with her daughter. I believe they were working on homework. All right. After my client was arrested, did you have a conversation with his wife? Yes, I did. What did you ask her? I asked her if she was aware of her husband's activity. And what was her response? Objection calls for hearsay. Sustained. Your Honor, it goes to state of mind. Sustained. Next question, please. Was anyone else present during your conversation with his wife? 
The child was there initially. I asked Mrs. Fox if I could speak to her in private. Why did you do that? I didn't want to have the conversation in front of the children. All right, what happened after that? There was another woman in the home, and she came and took the kids out while I was talking to the defendant's wife. Did you arrest his wife that day then? No, I did not. Is it fair to assume you did not arrest her because she wasn't involved in anything illegal then? Objection calls for legal conclusion. Overruled. You may answer. She was not arrested. That is because she had done nothing wrong, is that right? She wasn't arrested at that time because we didn't think she should be. Has she since been arrested? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. Your Honor, we need to approach sidebar on the record, please. Is this something that we can address at the break after the jury leaves? Yes, Your Honor. If I may have a moment, Your Honor. Certainly. Your Honor, after conferring with Ms. Hunt, I have nothing further at this time. Do you have any redirect? Just briefly, if I may. All right. Officer, I just wanted to clear up something here. As you were watching the defendant in his garage, did you observe what you believed to be a drug sale? Yes, I did. And did you have prior knowledge that something was going to occur at the defendant's home that afternoon? Yes, our undercover people had given us information. Is that why you were there that day or was this just a random event? It was not random. We had been watching the defendant for that very purpose that day. All right, and the information that you had been given was that the defendant was selling cocaine, marijuana, and meth out of his home. Is that right? Yes, that's right. On the day that you arrested the defendant, did you collect evidence from the defendant's home? Well, I didn't collect it, but other officers did. Were you made aware of certain evidence that was collected? Yes, I was the one in charge of overseeing that process. Did you make a list of everything that was seized from the defendant's home? Yes, I did. Before evidence is taken from the scene, are there photographs that are taken? Yes. Now, is everything labeled and marked in some way so that you can review that at a later time? Yes. There are people who take photographs before the evidence is even picked up from the scene and booked into evidence. Have you seen the photographs of the evidence seized? Yes, I have. Okay. Oh, wait. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma <laughs> All right. So this one's called Deposition Summary. Right, continuing and, on our drills. Okay. I am defense attorney. I am the court. I am the witness. And I am the plaintiff attorney. And it's literary material in drill form. Begins with me. This is a review of the deposition taken of claimant. The deposition was taken at this office on August 20, 2003. In my judgment, this witness is an average witness on her own behalf. She made a nice appearance and appeared to have no difficulty understanding and answering most of the questions that were asked. I believe that she makes a good witness on her own behalf. The claimant is a 34-year-old female who was born on October 19, 1959 in Korea. She presently resides at 2628 Pontiac Street, La Crescentia, California, 91294. She's been residing there for three years. She lives there with her husband and two children. Claimant has a California driver's license number C5316117, Class 3. It expires in 1996. There are no restrictions. Claimant is presently a housewife. She last worked as a secretary at Pinnacle in Los Angeles, California in 1988. She worked with that company for two years and has stopped working there since that time. Claimant testified that the accident occurred on May 30 at approximately 8.30 a.m. That date was a Saturday. She was traveling on the number two Glendale Freeway southbound near the interchange with the five freeway when the accident occurred. She testified that she was going to Los Angeles to take her mother to visit a physical therapist who was located in downtown LA. She could not recall the name of the physical therapist. However, her mother later testified that his name was Dr. Lee. The claimant testified that she had driven to that location before. They were scheduled for the appointment at 9 a.m. They left their home at approximately 8 a.m. The claimant had three passengers in her vehicle, including her mother and two children. Apparently, her mother was seated in the back seat. One of her daughters was seated in the front seat, and the other daughter was seated in a car seat in the back. Claimant was driving in the number three and four lanes when the impact occurred. She denied making any lane changes in the five minutes before the accident occurred. She testified that she was going to take the number two freeway into Los Angeles. She had been traveling on the number two freeway approximately 30 minutes before the impact occurred 
and had only two lane changes during that time. She described traffic as moderate as it was a Saturday. She was driving an old Cutlass. She had owned that car approximately four years before the date of the accident. Clayman did not see the defendant's vehicle prior to the impact. She also did not notice this vehicle while she was traveling on the number two freeway. She did not hear any horns honking nor any brakes squealing before the impact occurred. She testified that their vehicle was struck near the right rear quarter panel of the car. She described the impact as heavy and testified that the vehicle was slightly pushed into the lane to their left. However, she could not estimate how far their car was pushed into that lane, nor could she tell me what part of the car was pushed into that lane. She did not lose control of the car as a result of the impact. Claimant testified that she was wearing her seatbelt when the impact occurred. She testified no parts of her body hit the interior of the car. She testified that the other vehicle involved in this accident sustained damage to the front left side. She described his vehicle as being a small black sports car. Apparently after the impact occurred, he continued approximately two miles on the freeway before he pulled over to the side. Claimant testified that she spoke with the driver of the other vehicle, who was a man. They exchanged insurance information and driver's license information. He advised her that he was half asleep when the accident occurred, but did not say anything else. Their conversation lasted approximately 10 minutes. After they spoke with the driver of the other car, they proceeded on to the medical facility where her mother was going to receive physical therapy treatment. Claimant testified that they did not speak with anyone else at the scene of the accident. She denied there being any witnesses to the accident. Claimant testified that she did not experience any pain at the scene of the accident. She first began experiencing pain the following afternoon, at which time she felt pain to her neck and lower back. And she testified that on the date of the accident, she went to the physical therapy clinic where her mother was receiving treatment. However, she did not receive treatment there, nor did she request to be examined by anyone there. She apparently does have the name of this doctor at her home. They were at this facility for approximately one and a half hours, during which time her mother received physical therapy treatment to her knees. Apparently, her mother has some sort of arthritic condition to both knees, and that was why she was receiving treatment there. Claimant testified that her children were not injured in this accident. However, apparently, they were scared and crying after the accident occurred. She also testified that the mother experienced pain at the scene, which included pain to her neck, both shoulders, and lower back. Claimant first sought medical attention with an acupuncturist at the acupuncture center on June 1st. She had never been to that facility before. At her first visit, she complained of pain to her neck and lower back. She was given acupuncture treatment on the first visit, which lasted 40 minutes. The treatment recommended by the acupuncturist included acupuncture treatment three to four times a week. She did receive that treatment until September 15. Apparently, the claimant went to Korea during the time that she was receiving treatment and was there from July 15 to August 15. When she returned to the United States, she resumed her acupuncture treatment at the acupuncture center. She was treated there approximately 30 to 40 times. She stopped treatment there because she believed she was improving. Claimant did testify that she was advised to do exercises at home, which she did for approximately two months. The exercises would take her approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Claimant has not seen any other doctors for the injuries she sustained in this accident. She's not scheduled to see any other doctors either. Claimant testified that she has not fully recovered from the injuries she sustained in this accident. She continues to experience pain to her lower back, which appears to be aggravated when she climbs the stairs. She does not have this pain every day. In the past month, she had the pain approximately three times a week, and the pain lasted approximately 10 to 15 minutes. She does not take any medication, nor does she do anything to alleviate the pain. At this point, it appears that the discovery is complete. We have a record review from the doctor, which indicates that the treatment rendered in this case was not reasonable nor necessary. The charges were excessive, and the type of treatment received by the claimants does not appear to correlate to their injuries. <coughs> How far are we going? All right, so we're going to start at the top. 
Um, this one is directions. This drill is called directions. <coughs> Do the whole thing. <coughs> All right, begins with me. <coughs> Exit 5 Freeway at Rosecrans Avenue and head east. Exit 405 Freeway at Lakewood going south. Turn left on Willow, right on Clark, and right on Garford to Beverly Plaza. Exit 710 Freeway South at Broadway. Follow to Pacific and turn left. On one block to 3rd Street, turn left. Bellamar is on the right. From the 405 Freeway, take the 710 Freeway South, exit at Broadway, and turn right on Magnolia. Take a left on Ocean Boulevard, and we're, we're on the right-hand side across from the City Hall building. Exit 91 Freeway at Carmenita and head south. Go approximately one block to South Street and turn right. Exit the 5 Freeway at Valley View and head north approximately 2.5 miles. Turn left on Leffingwell Road. Go one block. Exit 91 Freeway at Cherry and head south. Go 1.5 miles to Market Street and turn left. Fountain View is on your left. Exit 605 Freeway at Imperial Highway, Firestone Boulevard, and turn right onto Imperial Highway. Head east to Studebaker and turn left. So we are between Imperial and Firestone off Studebaker on your right. Exit 710 Freeway at Shoreline Drive to Ocean Boulevard. Turn left. Go to Linden and turn left. Enter visitor parking underground. Exit 405 Freeway at Lakewood Boulevard. Go south to Hathaway Avenue. Turn right. Go halfway down the block. We are on the left. Exit 405 Freeway at Lakewood Boulevard and turn north. Go to Hardwick Avenue and turn left. Head one block to Hayter Avenue and turn left. Exit 405 Freeway at Lakewood Boulevard. Go south. Turn right on Pacific Coast Highway to Termino. Then right to Marbrissa. Head south through the traffic circle. Go towards Pacific Coast Highway to Emino and turn right. Exit the 5 or 91 freeways at Beach Boulevard north to Imperial Highway. Turn left. Go 0 0.5 miles to Santa Gertrudis. Turn right. We are on the left. Or from 605 freeway, exit Whittier Boulevard. Head east to south Santa Gertrudis and turn right. Exit 710 Freeway South at Broadway, turn left on Pine Avenue, left on 3rd Avenue, and left into gated parking garage entry. Between 405 and 710 Freeways, on Ocean Boulevard between Cherry Avenue and Hermosa Avenue. 91 Freeway to 605 Freeway North, exit Alondra. Go west to Woodruff, turn north. We are on your left. Located at Pacific Coast Highway and Clark Avenue, accessible from 405, 22, 605, 91, and 710 freeways. Exit the 605 freeway at Firestone East. Continue east until you reach the Palm, or exit the 5 freeway at North Norwalk Boulevard. Turn left on Norwalk, right on Firestone. We are one half mile ahead on the right. Exit 91 Freeway at Paramount Boulevard and head south two miles. We're on the right. Or exit 405 Freeway at Lakewood Boulevard north to Carson Street and turn left. Go to Paramount Boulevard and turn right. We're on the left. Exit 405 Freeway at 7th Street to Channel Drive and turn left. Go to Bixby Village Drive, turn left. Head down the street to the Pathways driveway, turn right and follow the signs. Exit 710 Freeway at 6th Street, one half mile to Locust Street and turn left. Head north three blocks to 9th Street. We are on your right at the corner of 9th and Locust. Exit 605 Freeway at South Street, head west to Studebaker, then turn north. Go just under one mile to Artesia and turn left. Via La Paz is 0.6 miles on your right between Palo Verde Avenue and Woodruff Avenue. Exit 5 Freeway at Rosecrans Street East. Go to Shoemaker, turn left. We are on your left. Head south on the 55 Freeway. Continue on to Newport Boulevard. Turn right on 17th Street left on Superior. Exit the 405 at Brookhurst South and head towards the beach. We are four miles ahead, one mile from PCH. Okay, I'll mark it right there. Here we go. I am defense attorney, Mr. Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R. -E I am the court. I am the witness. And I am plaintiff attorney, Mr. Andrews, A-N-D-R-E-W-S. And this is a 10 minute, right? Yes. Okay, 10 minutes. Ready? Nevada's passed CSR from 07. 
begins with me. Your Honor, I think he is asking for a legal conclusion from a lay witness. I am not sure she is capable of answering the question. Well, we all realize that Ms. Jensen is not a lawyer. I think he is asking for what her understanding was at the time, for whatever it was, was worth. Overruled. As far as you knew, everything that he did was done as your agent? That's right. As far as I know, everything he did was done as my agent. Now then, on or about January of 1992, did you own a business known as Ben's Pub? I think so. And I take it that was a tavern or bar by the name? Yes. Do you recall signing a listing agreement with the Wood Realty Company? Yes, I do. And that was related to the sale of Ben's Pub in Las Vegas, Nevada? It wasn't in Las Vegas. It was out on the highway. Well, Ben's Pub was located out on the highway, but the listing was signed in Las Vegas, correct? Yes. And was that George Bishop who took the listing? I believe it was, but couldn't swear to that. I just can't remember his name. How do you spell that? It is B-I-S-H-O-P. Thank you. I guess I didn't understand the name when she said it. And did Mr. Bishop call you there at your business? Yes, he did. Didn't he call you at your request? No, he came of his own volition. I take it that he asked you whether you wanted to sell your business? That's right, he did. Did he then fill out a listing form in your presence? No, he didn't, as a matter of fact. What did happen? Your Honor, aren't we getting into a narrative answer? Perhaps, but let's give it a chance to see where it is going. If that is an objection, it's overruled. What did Mr. Bishop say when he came over to your apartment? He talked to me about selling the business, but I wasn't too interested in selling it. What was his reaction to that? Well, he tried to talk me into it, and I told him that I would give him a 14-day listing, and that was all. Did he fill out a 14-day listing? That's right. Did he fill out the listing in his handwriting? Yes, he filled it out. I take it that he asked you questions and you would give him answers? That's right. And he would put the information down? Who is testifying here, Your Honor? I think Mr. Warner is just trying to save time. However, it would be better if the questions didn't suggest the answers. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Did you sign the listing? Yes, he asked me to sign the completed listing form. Did he give you a copy of it? Yes, he did. Do you recall the subject of the number of kegs coming up? We talked about the gross sales, and I said 15 or 16 kegs. Was it 15 or 16? What was it she just said? No, it was 15 or 16 or maybe 65. Thank you. What kind of beer did you sell there in kegs? We were selling Miller. Did you discuss how long you had had this beer bar prior to January? No, we didn't talk about that. How long did you have it? Roughly about eight or nine months. Do you recall when it was you purchased it? I'm not absolutely sure of the date, no. Do you have that date available? I can look it up. Approximately in March or April of the prior year, I'm trying to count backwards from January. Yes, it was close in there, but I wouldn't say for sure because you would purchase it and then you would have to wait some time before you would get your license. Do you remember when it was you took over? I would say around the end of June, but I am not sure. It would be the end of June or the first of July. At this time, did you have Miller there on tap? No, I didn't. When did you put Miller beer in? I can't remember that either. Was it before <coughs> or after the end of the year? Well, I am sure that it was before December. As I recall, it was probably in October. We just want your best recollection. The best I can remember, yes. I can look it up. It was with all these papers, but I don't remember for sure. Do you have records at your disposal that would indicate when the Miller beer was installed? No, but they are available at the beer company. All right. Now, was Lewis Jensen connected in any way with Ben's Pub? How do you mean? Well, was he in any way connected with it? Management, operations, ownership. Was he in any way connected with it? He worked out there sometimes, that was all. As a bartender? Yes. Do you? To your knowledge, did Mr. Jensen have a beer bar of his own about that time? Yes, he did. What was the name of that tavern? Lou's Den. Lou's Den? Yes. Do you know where that was located? It was out on Highway 147. Do you know when Mr. Jensen sold Lou's Bar? No. When I sold it? Objection, Your Honor. On the grounds of relevance, I don't think this is material. I can connect it up. 
Overruled with the provision, it is connected. Do you know when he sold it? I couldn't tell you the date. I don't remember dates very well. And did he sell it before or after January of 2001? Well, as I recall, it was sold before that. I can't say for sure. And did Mr. Jensen devote substantially his full time to Ben's Pub when he sold the other place? He worked out there a good deal, yes. Now, did you work a regular shift out there? Generally speaking, yes, I did. And did you work the same shift as Mr. Jensen? Some Sometimes I would, yes. It would depend on how busy we were. And then I take it that Mr. Jensen would work a shift occasionally by himself, too? Oh, sometimes, yes. Would the witness speak up? I'm having trouble hearing her. Yes, we would all appreciate it if you would speak a little bit louder. We all have to hear you. I'm sorry. That's all right. Just make an effort to speak up a little louder. I will try. Thank you. Do you recall going to an escrow in connection with the cell of Ben's pub? Yes, I do. I'm just curious. Where did the name Ben come from in all of this? Ben was our dog. Oh, I see. Thank you for satisfying my curiosity. Proceed, Mr. Warner. This escrow involving Barbara and Frank Boykin, the plaintiffs in this action we're talking about, was that escrow opened in February? I thought it was April, but I could be mistaken. I think the record reflects that the escrow was opened on February 4, 2002. Yes, 2003. 2003. Okay, I am sorry. Anyway, I don't know exactly what he is referring to. Rephrase the question, Mr. Warner. Let's start over. I am going to show you personal property escrow instructions and ask you whether you recognize recognize your signature. Yes. And this is dated February 4, 2003, isn't it? Well, this is when it opened. And that's what I mean. It says seller warrants she has purchased 55 to 60 kegs per month from Miller and can prove the same. All right. Do you recall making that representation? I would have to think real hard. They put it... I don't remember exactly what they put into it. Well, it is there. And you did identify your signature, didn't you? Yes. Do you recall making the representation to Mr. or Mrs. Boykin that Ben's Pub sold 55 to 60 kegs of beer per month? Objection. On what grounds? If that is a distinct question and not related to item 18, then I have no objection. And? If it is an attempt to rephrase item 18, I would object to it. Let me explore it a little bit differently then. Proceed. Do you recall having any oral discussions with Mr. and Mrs. Boykin in connection with? I had quite a number of discussions with them. Do you recall talking about the amount of beer that was being sold at Ben's Pub? Yes, we discussed it. Did you ever make any statement to them that there were 55 to 60 kegs of beer? Oh, roughly thereabouts, yes. Nothing that was absolutely definite. Did you say 55 to 60 kegs? I don't remember exactly that. Do you remember what you did say? I might have said 55 to 60. I might not. I don't know. All right. I know that I could figure roughly how many I would get. Were you only selling Miller beer or was there any other brand being sold? There were others. What other companies did you deal with? I had beer from Budweiser. At the same time you sold Miller? No, I don't think so. Well, partly. Did you have Budweiser in the place when you took it over? No, I didn't. It had Coors in it when I took it over. Back in June of 2003? Well, whatever it was. And do you recall how long you had Coors? I would have a hard time remembering that. Maybe two or three months. I don't know. And then at that time, you changed it to Budweiser? Yes. Now, at that time that you sold Coors, did you have any other brands? No, I didn't. No other tap beers? No. And then you changed to Budweiser? Right. At the time you had Budweiser, did you have any other brand of tap beers? Yes, I had Budweiser and then I had Miller. I had both on tap. How long did you keep the Budweiser and the Miller together? I really don't know for sure. Would it be more or less than three months? I don't know for sure. I would have to check. Well, if you had cores for possibly two or three months. Or possibly one. One for sure. That would be somewhere around the end of August. And then you changed to Budweiser, is that correct? I think so. When you changed to Budweiser, did you put in Miller at the same time or later? Your Honor, we have been all over this and over it and over it. I am just checking on one more issue here. It is late and we would all appreciate it if you would get on with it. Was it at the same time or later? It wasn't too much later. I don't know. I had Budweiser in and we got Miller too. 
I couldn't tell you for sure exactly when or how long it was, but I had them both on tap. Do you recall whether you had Bud on tap with Miller as late as possibly December? That would be about a month before you signed the listing. I am really not sure. The only thing I could do would be to look at the records. Which records? Which records are you referring to? The beer records. They have records of everything you do. Were the deliveries of Miller made directly to Ben's Pub or were they dropped somewhere else? They were dropped mostly at Ben's Pub. Or were there occasions where shipments were dropped?